talking about the greatest crisis that the church faces in our age, which is essentially its secularization. And the reason it is the greatest crisis is because it is a crisis that affects whether or not the church is driven by the Holy Spirit or by an antithetical spirit, by the spirit of God or the spirit of the age, uh, by the Holy Spirit or by the Zeitgeist. And you can see, if we put it in those terms, that the danger of a church being driven by the wrong spirit uh, is one of the greatest dangers that it can face. And so I want to use the death and the, the, cele the celebrations of Desmond Tutu's life as a platform to build this uh, perception on that I want to, to share through this video. When Desmond Tutu died, I was invited on to, to, to television to give an assessment of his life, and I found myself celebrating him quite rightly for some marvellous achievements. And the, the biggest achievement, I thought, was the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission, where he persuaded the people of South Africa that knowing the truth was more important than taking revenge, or even, to some extent, than the implementation of justice against people who had behaved so murderously and barbarously against the indigenous population. You can see, we can all see, that this is a very delicate matter, a knife edge of morality. Uh, we want both revenge and justice, and sometimes it's extremely difficult to unravel the two so profoundly that we might be willing to give up the truth in order to do it. But Tutu's great achievement was that he injected into the South African political station, uh, South African political situation, a sufficient degree of Christian ethical virtue to save that country from a bloodbath. This was the most magnificent achievement. However, uh, Tutu, like the rest of us, um, was was a complex man, uh, and uh, uh, in many ways a delightful character, a man of genuine humility, a, a man of charm and laughter, what's not to like? The problem is that as, as his ministry expanded, as we got to know more about him, there came telltale signs that <clears throat> he had surrendered himself to the other, to some extent to the other side. Now, this is a very serious accusation, and it's, a, it's an accusation I'm going to bring to against Justin Welby and, and, and the Church of England. So one must be very careful about the way one does this and also very careful not to judge the people involved, but to judge, if you like, the ethics, the theology, but essentially the spirit involved. Um, and perhaps we can say for a moment that, that, that you'll have in your mind the uh, instructions not to judge or to judge, in the way, judge others in the way you want them to judge you. So... <clears throat> Um, but this is not inviting us never to exercise the gift of discernment. D judging in the sense of do not judge, I, I hear as don't condemn, don't diss, don't put people down, don't do character assassination. But we are entitled, in fact, we are required to exercise a degree of spiritual discernment in order to distinguish between the person and the values that are driving them or the values that have captured us. And the same thing would be true of me. I have no virtue except that God loves me and my values are sometimes mistaken and disordered. Uh, and uh, it's to my benefit if we can make the distinction between, uh, between the person and the view. So let's try and do that with Desmond Tutu. 
I want to suggest that the great distinction that's being made here is one between the law and the spirit, between the flesh and the spirit, between the mistake that people make by thinking that if you legislate for virtuous laws, you can change people so they become better people in the, in, in the, in the living out of those laws. I think this is part of a great misunderstanding of secular utopianism. It's one of the great tragedies of the left. And we see it being worked out in the murderousness of communism. So what happens is if you begin to implement laws, as we have done with, with our own politically correct culture, you start off by saying to people, well, you must, you must not say the following things, and then you must not think the following things. And then society begins to either then criticise, then cancel, then imprison, and finally <clears throat> to kill them. Uh, and this is because it makes a fundamental mistake. You cannot change human nature by imposing a framework of virtuous law on people. Christianity does it exactly the other way around. And it's this fundamental mistake about the orientation of these two things that leads to secularised church and to secularised Christianity. What Christianity does is to say we must save the soul of the person. And in saving the soul of the person, this will bring about a transformation of mind and of value. And as we bring about the transformation of mind and value of individual people, we will get to a point where there's a collective moral weight that then begins to express itself in legislation and social custom. And that's Christendom. The problem that we've had in the past is that, uh, is that the numbers of people who've been saved and transformed have been diminishing, leaving us only with the fabric of Christendom. People have looked at and said, well, it's empty and hypocritical. We have to replace it with other values, which is what's taking place at the moment. What I want to suggest is that uh, there are telltale signs when the spirit of the age, when secularism, when the other spirit, essentially we're talking, of course, about the demonic, uh, gets hold of the church and begins to work through it. And I want with great reluctance to use the life and the values of Desmond Tutu to try and explain how that might happen. One of the things, one of the signs that you're dealing with the zeitgeist or the demonic or a perverting spirit is when anti-Semitism crops up. The Jews are God's people, they're God's chosen people. They may have rejected, some of them may have rejected Jesus the Messiah, but you can see St Paul in Romans trying to work through this paradox, this conundrum, that it doesn't stop them being any more God's people, that, that many of them refused, were unable to see Jesus, the Logos, when he came. Uh, St Paul says this will all be put right in the end, and we, have to leave, we just have to live with the mess of this, uh, this dissonance in the meantime. But... Wherever you find hatred of the Jews, wherever you find anti-Semitism, a punishment of the Jews, you know there that the perverse spirit has got in. In order not to get thrown off YouTube, let me put this hypothetically. Were you to find a religion, for example, where it was driven by a hatred of the Jewish people, uh, you might then say to yourself, something's got into this religion. Let's leave aside the whole religion by itself. But you would say some, that a, a perverse spirit has poisoned this religion. So it is not the Holy Spirit working. What the Holy Spirit does is recognise where God has been at work, protect it, amplify it, deepen it, restore it. And one of the problems we have with Desmond Tutu is that we found him becoming increasingly anti-Semitic during that. He began to say things that suggested he even hated the Jews. Well, of course, this was partly in the context of him seeking justice. He'd become a prophet of secular justice. He was known throughout the world world almost as a secular saint, because he had achieved so much in South Africa. But in doing so, he adopted a value system of always prioritising what he perceived as being the underdog. And yet, we have two things now. We have a, we have a concept, a concept, a, a framework of ethical value. But at the same time, we have this spirit. And the great difficulty we have is always evaluating the ethical priorities and observing the spirit and the bad spirit got in and inflamed a, 
a deep antipathy to God's people in him, in his support of the Palestinian cause. Uh, one should support Palestinians in the sense that one should support both the Jews and the Palestinians and any solution that works out a way of meeting both their needs, which of course is immensely difficult, what one cannot do is to become uh, anti-Jewish. I would say even anti-Israel, although Israel perhaps is the political expression of Judaism. And of course, political Judaism can behave very badly indeed and should be held to account for it. But this can so quickly move into anti-Semitism as it did with Desmond Tutu. And so what we discover in Desmond Tutu is a very virtuous man who'd achieved wonderful things in South Africa, uh, undoubtedly things that, that, that were reflections of the kingdom of heaven, but who found himself polluted by this adversarial spirit that expressed itself in anti-Semitism. We find it too in his support of the LGBTQ plus values. And I want to make a distinction between LGBTQ plus people whom we should support and love as we support and love all those made in God's image and the practices and the values. This is a very difficult distinction to make and it's one that's completely lost on secular culture. They don't believe that if we don't buy in to the sexual culture of a group or a person that we can't love or care for them or want the best for them. But this is the great difficulty that the church has in our particular age. Uh, I too, like Tutu, found myself caught by this perverse spirit without knowing it. And for about 15 years, I was a great supporter, both of LGBTQ plus people, and then, of the, and then slowly of their practices. Uh, this is probably the, the, the matter for another video, but, but I was moved out of it by discovering the disparity between the actual practices within the community and the presentation that the media did. I, I was astonished to discover, for example, that lesbian couples uh, suffer from a level of, of domestic violence and emotional instability that is considerably higher than any other of, of the potential groupings amongst people and that, that gay men suffer from a degree of sexual incontinence that uh, is not held in place by saying, well, we believe in exclusive faithful relationships. Uh, and for me, it was the discovery that the virtues that I had assumed that went along with the culture uh, were to some large extent missing in reality that maybe then begin to question the way in which I had for perfectly good reasons I liked the people I had a lot of homosexual male friends and a lot of lesbian women friends I wanted to care for the vulnerable I had the normal Christian instincts for the dispossessed and the marginalized <clears throat> but unfortunately these perfectly proper instincts uh, overflowed in and, and blurred a, an, an awareness of the spiritual dynamics. How can we express that best? We have to say that the way, it's all a matter of, of the sanctification of appetite. And the Christianity and Judaism have understood sex to be dangerous and need to be contained because it is a catalyst for certain kind of appetites, for the lower kind of appetites. We must, we must be allowed to make a distinction between the lower and the upper appetites in the same way as we make a distinction between law and spirit and flesh and spirit. And so Judaism and Christianity have said sex must be contained in a particular environment. It's in the context of marriage between men and women and essentially for the procreation of children. Otherwise, it gets out of hand. And it's this getting out of hand and the, the inflaming of disordered appetites Whoever you're attracted to, it's got nothing to do with being straight, bi or gay. It's about the inflaming of disordered appetites outside a particular framework that can hold them, order them and sanctify them. And it's the sanctifying of appetites that is so enormously difficult and which the progressive church has given up completely on and perhaps doesn't even understand and doesn't even see. And so for me, a friend of mine who was a Catholic exorcist, I was talking this over with, said, well, 
uh, we we I, we agreed of what I would do is for for a year I would look at all the pastoral situations were brought to me and I would assess them through the traditionalist view of ethics and through the progressive view that I'd adopted. And after a year, it became clear to me that the progressive view did not tell the proper truth about what was going on, but the traditionalist one did. And I think this was partly an expression of 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 a, a social secular compassion uh, which ignored the spiritual dynamic of what was going on and that of course is one of the things that the church finds most difficult this this gift which the holy spirit brings of discernment between the different spirits between good and evil but between the ordering of the appetites we have to pray for the gift of discernment. And so as we look at Desmond Tutu's life and we saw then, first of all, this, this sudden expression of anti-Semitism, and then we see in his life too, this unfettered promotion of the whole LGBTQ plus experiment without any distinction made between the values of the people themselves and the values and the ethics of the lifestyle and the the, the theological and spiritual take on the way in which embodied the embodiment of love, sexual affection, was understood or assessed or contained or changed. There was none of that. And so here we have we have two signs that the wrong spirit has entered into the church. We see the same thing, I'm afraid, in terms of of the Archiepiscopate of Archbishop Welby, it's who, who I'm sure is a very good man who needs our prayers uh, and we commend him to God's mercy. But the views that he's taken and the direction that he's taken the church are profoundly problematic for the role that the church has in our disordered, highly sexualized, highly politicized culture. I remember my shock when I saw that he'd written a foreword commending on on uh, on in, in a book commending uh, the whole project of gen gender dysphoria um, and the pursuit of the change of sexuality. What was particularly sad was that that the the background that formed Welby, Holy Trinity Brompton, the Alpha movement, the charismatic movement that promised to renew the Church of England uh, in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, but somehow faltered and then was hijacked and 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 disappeared. That itself is a, another whole matter, uh, again, for understanding and discernment. The tragedy is that, that that whole movement of charismatic renewal, which produced Welby, has so dissolved or dissipated that in the end it it led to this emphasis on inclusion and, and the sanctification of disordered appetites and disordered persons. This is, this is deeply tragic, particularly because it's spread throughout the Church of England. And so these, no, these social and political notions of inclusion and diversity and equality uh, and of uh, the complete absence of spiritual discernment about the way in which sexual affection is expressed have produced a church that has given it what given way to the spirit of the age the secular spirit the zeitgeist the adversarial spirit what's the justification what's our epistemology what's our our authority for saying any of this the answer is that the problem we have with the present progressive ethical values is that they're at odds with the scriptures. And so, of course, people have taken a lot of time and trouble to try and twist the scriptures to make them mean different things. A great example would have been Galatians chapter 3. In Christ there is no male or female, no Jew or Greek, uh, no slave or free. 
wholly misrepresenting this passage, which is replicated in Colossians in a far more spiritual sense. What St Paul is really doing is saying, look at these great fractures in society, fractures in the world, these great antipathies and struggles for power between people. And he gives these three major categories of of, sexual, of, of men and women, uh, of, of uh, rationality and revelation, Jews and Greeks, uh, and of empowerment and disempowerment, slaves and free. And he says, we don't ally ourselves with any of these categories because once we come into Christ, they're subsumed into an entirely, an entirely revolutionized Christian nature. Uh, and, and, and of course, the progressives have taken this passage to twist it to mean there's no distinction between male and female. And therefore, um, uh, the distinctions that the Old Testament is very clear to make and are also made throughout the rest of the, of the New Testament uh, are set aside. This is a terrible misreading of what St. Paul meant and a, a travesty, a perversion, in fact, of the categories that Jesus is talking about. But let us take, let us take, allow that to take us back to what the Christian project did. It, it is about the renewal of the soul. It begins with the salvation of the soul, and that changes to the renewal of the mind and the heart. And it's this renewal of the mind and the heart that produces, uh, that produces the values of the kingdom. And where you have enough people converted, enough people saved, enough people renewed, this can begin to express itself in terms of the way in which um, humans are, the society we live in can have its laws and its values constructed in a way that most reflects Christian virtue, which, and that was the great triumph of, of the medieval church and, and of Christendom. And the great tragedy is when the church lost sight of the need to convert souls, to make new people in Christ. And so the weight of Christendom, the weight of Christian law and custom was unsupported by, by changed people. Another sign where people have, have become captured by the wrong spirit is where the church begins to stop talking about saving souls and when it stops talking about hell. And I'd just like to speak a little bit about hell for the moment because it's, it's precisely when the church understands the struggle for heaven and against hell, that it is most true to itself and has an antidote to this secularization. Uh, in a later video, I'm going to talk about my own experiences of evil and hell and of the churches. But for the moment, let me talk about something that I think that all of us can understand and all of us have experienced. And it is it is the hell of the lack of forgiveness. The problem with, 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 with us is that uh, we get caught in in anti-God, um, uh, anti-spirit uh, modes of being that we can't escape from. And forgiveness will be the best example, where our hearts get hardened and we say we absolutely refuse to forgive. We refuse to turn the other cheek. We refuse to forgive. We want our justice uh, and we find relationships broken forever. And there God will not impose forgiveness on us. He invites us to repent. And there simply is no alternative. Uh, and in those and what we discover is if we don't repent, we find our hearts becoming hardened. And the danger for hell for all of us is when our wills and our hearts become hardened in an anti-God attitude where he can't get his hand on us. As a Catholic, I believe in purgatory so that the soul can be saved uh, and, and, and those parts of ourselves that have become concreted over into anti-Godness can become slowly and I'm sure painfully melted in purgatory but it would be better if they were slowly uh, and painfully melted now and indeed it can happen more quickly more effectively in time and space and it can happen afterwards so let's deal with that my experience of having my heart hardened over and and, and feeling hell begin to impose itself upon me was to say to god lord I, it, it, it's not that i well there's this difficulty with coming is it i can't forgive or i won't forgive i've i've had to say to god look I can't do this. You're going to have to help me. Help me forgive. Help me repent. Because I either can't or I won't. I can't tell which it is, but you have to help me. It's like the father in the Gospels who said, Lord, I believe. Help my disbelief. Lord, I want to repent. Help me where I don't want to repent. 
But I've certainly experienced both in the inflammation of, of disordered appetite and in refusal to forgive and in the difficulties of having my pride evoked where I've been attacked and <laughs> found it immensely difficult to let go of defending myself. I found, I felt the taste of hell, the concreting over of the car park, over the vegetation of the kingdom, this hardening that takes place. I mean, what you find in a politicized, secularized church is a refusal to understand or to be aware of this great destruction of the soul, this hardening of the heart, this creeping, this slow creep of hell <clears throat> into the human heart. So wherever the church no longer talks about the salvation of souls, about repentance, about heaven and hell, you know it's been captured by the wrong spirit, by the wrong side. And that sadly is entirely true of Anglicanism today. And I have to say that the whole same struggle is of course taking place in the Catholic Church. It's my fervent hope and belief that this struggle can be won in the Catholic Church. So it's looking a bit dicey at the moment. Um, but the very fact that it looks dicey is, is an invitation to struggle and to pray harder. The difficulty in Anglicanism is there is no magisterium, there is no settled weight of tradition that one can refer to to say, look, this is how the scriptures are rightly understood. Anyone can change verses of scripture to make them uh, support our own particular quirky views or the views of a movement in culture. But within the historic churches, uh, outside Protestantism, Protestantism, you have at least a, a weight of holiness too, and the miracles that go with holiness. So you look at the saints, you look at Padre Pio, you look at Helena Faustina, you look at Teresa of Avila, or Bridget of Sweden, Catherine of Siena, whoever your favourite saints are, and you say the values that they uh, exemplified and held to consistent throughout Christian tradition, St. Paul, St. Augustine, St. Francis, St. Dominic. This is the kingdom of heaven. And it's precisely these values of sexual continence and repentance of the understanding of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit that the Catholic and the Orthodox Church embody at their best, although without going down, down this particular route, there's a civil war, a life or death struggle in them today. Of course there is, because we live in an age where the zeitgeist, where the alternative spirit, where the anti-spirit has gained such power. Many of us think that the reason it's gained such power is because of the scale of human abortion and by the slaughtering of the unborn in the scale that we have, we have, our society has given evil greater traction and that's one of the reasons why the church is on its back foot and reeling as it struggles with the anti-spirit we are on the back foot we are reeling with the anti-spirit and that's one of the reasons why looking at a hero like desmond tutu we are invited to make some kind of act of discernment some kind of act of discrimination in order, as we look at the way in which Anglicanism is being led and the values that is being exemplified, in order that we can renew the church and help people gain a greater sensitivity to the work of the Holy Spirit. This comes through prayer, through fasting, which I'm very bad at and hate, through repentance, which I'm very bad at and hate, but it's absolutely essential. And, and, and here we have a way of distinguishing. I hope I've offered some ways of making a distinction between secularized Christianity being driven by the wrong spirit and authentic Christianity, where the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, between the mind and the spirit, between love and power, is at least authentically understood. Only if we understand it can we engage in it. May God save and help his church. May he continue to give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit and above all the gift 
of wisdom and above all the capacity to repent. Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, to God alone be the glory. Thank you those of you who've reached out to me personally and told me about your personal responses to these videos. I'm extremely grateful and it's a great joy to get to know you personally and to have some kind of communication. Thank you for all of you who leave comments and to allow a conversation to continue um, on, on YouTube. I'm grateful and thank you for those of you who support this project practically. I can't tell you how grateful I am and thank you for those of you who, who, who pray uh, and who make this journey together. God bless you and keep you. Let's continue what God has given us to do. To him be the praise and the glory. Amen. Thank you.